Well, good morning. Happy New Year. So uh, 2023, almost behind us, right? So we'll uh, uh, welcome 2024. Hopefully everybody had a good Merry Christmas. Good, good. We did as well. It's always great to see uh, uh, friends and family around the Christmas time. And um, we know that some people are still traveling, so we want to keep them in our, in our prayers. And it's great to see uh, we have some, uh, 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 not, I'm not even going to call you guests. You're just you know, part of the family. Uh, Ashley and, and her family and, and uh, others that are joining us, Thomas and Lori are here as well. And so, so we want to welcome everybody uh, to our service this morning. And uh, what a wonderful day it is to be able to continue to celebrate uh, the birth of our Lord and Savior. And uh, so again, uh, you know, throughout the year, um, you know, this is, uh, this is a special time uh, for us to be able to celebrate not only on Christmas in December, but throughout the year. And as our Lord and Savior, uh, we know that uh, his true purpose for really for coming into this world is to, uh, uh, to save us from our sins. And, uh, you know, by the sunshine today, it seems like we should be celebrating Easter, uh, you know, today. So, but we do want to um, uh, welcome those who are joining us online, welcome any of our guests that are here th this morning. Uh, if uh, there's a uh, uh, card in the, in the uh in your pew pocket, uh, if you uh, want to fill that out, and uh, we'd like to get to know you a little bit. So just a couple uh, small announcements this morning. Um, I did want to uh, let you know that we are going to be starting back up uh, the men's Bible study a week from tomorrow. So not tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow's New Year's Day, uh, but a week from Monday uh, at 7 o'clock. Uh, the ladies will start up later. Uh, I do not have an exact date or time for that, so... Uh, announcements will be coming out uh, regarding that. Um, we also, uh, for the ladies, it, it is in the bulletin, it's been in there for the last uh, couple Sundays, but I did want to call attention to uh, the ladies' conference, uh, Be Still Ladies' Conference, uh, at, uh, on February 2nd through the 3rd, Friday and Saturday. So uh, there's information here, probably be more information coming. So ladies, uh, uh, please mark your calendars for that and uh, take an opportunity to invite uh, friends and neighbors to that as, as well. Um, so this morning, before we uh, uh, go into our service, I, I did want to uh, bring up, gentlemen, if we could bring up uh, the, the, the uh, pictures today and, and uh, the announcement. This is from uh, Pastor Ellisay, and uh, this is something that uh, Pastor had sent to or excuse me, yes, Pastor Ellisay sent it to Pastor Zach, and I'd, I'll read it for you, uh, but it's also up here as well. Uh, we didn't sleep the whole night because of the missiles and drones, more than 100 missiles. There are several explosions in our city. About 30 people were injured. Several hundred apartments were damaged by rockets that exploded very nearby. This lasted all night and all morning. The church people are very anxious and stressed because they are tired. What does this mean for me? Our refugee shelter ministry is very important for many people who are left homeless. The war continues. Please pray that we will be able to continue this ministry. We are working on a building a bomb shelter and I understand that we must do this faster. Therefore, we will work seven days a week. Please pray that we can make the largest bomb shelter possible in the shortest possible time. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your support. Every donation makes a big difference in the lives of people we serve. And I think we have some, some pictures here that words really can't express. Um, several of us that, that were in Lviv, um, I was telling Judy when I saw these pictures, um, there's most likely that we were walking by um, you know, some of these uh, pictures that we just saw. So, you know, as, as we say goodbye to 23 and we look into 24, um, we look around, we uh, just celebrated Christmas, got, you know, whether it's uh, exchanging of, of cookies and gifts. Um, and uh, while we're doing that and while we're, you know, getting a good night's rest, uh, war continues and, and Ukraine um, and with Pastor Ellisay and the, the ministry that they are doing there with, with the refugees um, and the refugee center there that pretty much they've converted the church into a refugee center, um, the war continues. And, but even in the midst of war, Pastor uh, Ellisay is always saying, you know, praising God 
and uh, um, you know, is glad that we worship a God who is above war, who, who can uh, you know, offer protection and, and safety. So as we go through the service today, uh, we certainly want to remember them in prayer. Um, you know, I will uh, say that if there's opportunity to provide a special donation uh, in the next uh, week or two, uh, that would be greatly appreciated to help them uh, with their needs for the bomb shelter. Um, and then we also, obviously, uh, you, you know, also in that part, near that part of the country, we know um, with Israel and the war that's going on, um, you know, between uh, Hamas and Israel. So we want, to, we want to continue to keep Israel in our prayers, peace for Jerusalem. Um, and again, um, going back to, you know, the peace that we have in Jesus Christ. So regardless of what goes on and around us, um, we know God is in control of all things. So um, we'll definitely want to keep them in our, in our prayers this morning. Um, so uh, let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning in the quietness of our hearts, um, reflecting upon the many blessings that God has given us uh, in 2023. Uh, what we'll look forward to in 2024. We know that God is already in 2024, right? And uh, um, look forward to what he might uh, have prepared for us. So. Lord Jesus, we come to you this morning. We give you praise and we give you thanks, Father, for this day. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you that we could celebrate your birth, Jesus. Thank you for the time we've been able to have with friends, family, loved ones. As we gather together, as we celebrate Christmas, we celebrate your birth, let us not forget what you've done for us, Jesus, on the cross of Calvary. You saved us from our sins. We love you and we need you. As we close out the year of 2023, we want to praise you and thank you for your blessings. We want to thank you for the comfort and the strength that you provide, for the healing for the encouragement, for answered prayers, for those prayers yet to be answered because it is in your timing. May it strengthen our faith, Father. May we never lose our hope and our faith for we know, God, your word does not return void. You promise us that you will protect us you will provide for us. It may not always be in our timing or it may not always be what we believe is, is uh, uh, our desire, but Lord, we know that your plans are greater than our plans. So let us, Father, put our hope and strength and faith in you as we look into the new year, as we look at, Lord, what you have planned for us as a church, as your church, let us be bold in sharing the love to those around us, in our families, in our communities. Let your light shine brightly through us, that when others look at us, they see you, Jesus, in everything we do and everything we say. May it be to glorify your name. Be with those who are traveling. Continue to give safety to them. Bring our family, church family home safely. And as we gather together in the new year, we look forward to the message that you have for us in 2024. Father, we lift up Pastor Elise. We lift up his family, his wife, his daughter, son. Lord, will you continue to protect Pastor? 
and the ministry team there, the disciples ministry team. We protect the refugees, Lord. We protect Ukraine. Father, as we read the pastor's message, we sense the urgency of war continuing to uh, surround them, getting closer. But God, we know you are in control of all things. We know that peace is found through you. So we lift up Pastor Elise and his ministry team, and we pray for strength and endurance as they continue with the bomb shelter to protect your people and the refugees and the homeless. We pray, Lord, that their ministry would be able to continue. We pray that their financial needs would be able to be met. For God, nothing is impossible with you. With you, all things are possible. Let us be faithful, Father, in what you place on our hearts. As we go into the message this morning and the worship service, Lord, may your Holy Spirit be present with us. May you be with us in song and worship and, and uh, through Thomas's message. And we look forward, Father, to your love that you will share through your word. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let us stand for our uh, scripture reading this morning. And this morning's uh, scripture reading is from 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Thank you, Brian. Good morning, everybody. Uh, happy New Year. Blessed. I pray that it's a blessed 2024 for you. And just um, just one thing I want to just put, it's, it's come to my heart, I want to share with you. Is, is It's very simple, but just something we keep in mind, you know, especially as, as we were hearing about Pastor Ellisey, and we can't imagine what's, what they're going through. But it's very simple. If you know Jesus, you know peace. K-N-O-W, Jesus, K-N-O-W, peace. And without Jesus, no Jesus, N-O, Jesus, there's no N-O, peace. So just so grateful that God came and he lived with us and he lives with us and he um, did what he did on Resurrection Sunday as we celebrate. And so this wonderful song we're opening with, two more Christmas songs for you. But, um, but this one especially, you know, it just when you know Jesus, you know peace, and you just want to share it with everyone. So go tell it on the mountain.
Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. We praise you and thank you for your name. We thank you, Father, for the many blessings that you provide to us. We thank you for the, uh, the needs that are met through you, Lord, and we praise you and thank you for that. May you bless these tithes as we uh, return back to you, Father, what you so richly bless us with. May you use it to further your kingdom throughout the world, throughout the community, and may it be used to glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this morning we're blessed to have Ashley uh, share with us some special music this morning.
<laughs> it's okay. You can you can be proud of mom. Thank you, Ashley. That was that was beautiful, and uh, it's only 675 miles, I think, to New Bern. So you know, every weekend we could be blessed with that. Um, so thank you once again. It was beautiful. Um, this morning, uh, Thomas will will share with us on part three on uh, communication. Um, so we want to uh, welcome Thomas and uh, look forward to the message. Ashley, awesome job. Uh, you don't mind being embarrassed a little bit, do you? <laughs> so I may, I may mention, make a few mentions about just your gift that you shared with us this morning. It was interesting, you know, I kind of looked at mom and dad while you were singing, and there was this glow that over them. You'll find this out one day, because one day your kids will be in a similar situation, and just watching them glow over you uh, was just really a blessing to see that. Uh, I did want to take the time out to have my wife come up and give a greeting uh, this, this morning. Somebody asked if she was going to sing. Well, she's not going to sing, but she does play a mean saxophone. <laughs> not today. <laughs> uh, um, we just want to thank you for the way you welcomed, welcomed us into your home. And uh, I, I believe that this church embodies what Jesus said about in John 13, 35. He said, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have one, love one for one another. And not only just would you show them toward us, but would you uh, show toward each other and your outreaches. And I, this is just my personal opinion. I believe that one day this church is going to be packed with people. And so we just thank you for your hospitality. Right. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. She is <coughs> my secret weapon, no doubt about it. So we do want to close out our, uh, our series on Communication Matters. Um, I do ask to ask you to just suffer me a little bit this, this morning. I'm feeling a little under the weather. Uh, I got whatever's going around. I don't know if anyone else is experiencing that. Uh, but there's something going around in the, in, in the area of colds and flus. So. We're just, we're just dig, dealing with that. You know, one of the many projects I'm working on now, and there's a lot, anybody got a lot of pro undone projects? Oh my God. <laughs> it's crazy. One of my undone projects is I'm writing a book on the four tests of a godly man. And one of those tests is how you handle your word. So I knew that when I, as, as things were not going well physically this week, there was never a thought of not showing up because I gave this church, and I don't want to make this about me, I just want to make a teaching point here. I just long for the day in our culture where a person's word meant something again. Amen. I really do. Um, we would have such, a, we'd have a, uh, a revolution on our hands if we can just grab that one thing, if we understood the importance of keeping our Word and I was also so you know it's funny you know, see what Pastor Elize is going through in Ukraine. I have my friend Brad Brandon who is a missionary to Nigeria, and you know God has I don't know how God deals with you, but He's got a little bit of a sense of humor with me. He says, "Tom, really, is it that bad? Is it really that bad that you have to preach with a stuffy head and some congestion when people are dodging bullets and putting their lives on the line for me?" So. Uh, Lord, thank you for that. So we want to close out our series, Communication Matters, uh, three weeks. So for the first week, we, we talked about something we want to leave behind in 2023. There are some things that we all, I hope that we all have determined to leave some things behind in 20, 2023. And one thing I had suggested you leave behind is, is conflict. There are four constants in life, uh, t t death, taxes, conflict, and change, change and conflict. So uh, my prayer is that, and we talked about that the first week, that we would leave behind uh, conflict. And uh, last week we talked about, uh, week two was about a, a message we need to embrace today and forever, and that's your Christmas story. Because a Christmas story is God's ultimate communication to man. And lastly, this week I want to talk about something to strive for in 2024. I, I you know, honestly, I said this, I think I said this to Lauren, I was half joking, but I really wasn't joking. 
is if I were in a hospital bed and they had an IV hooked up to me, they would have been rolling me in here this morning <laughs> to preach this message, to share this message. I really said share this message because I think this is the message of our time. I think if we grasp this as a people, as a church, if we grasp this, I think we will start to have the influence that we really want to have as a body of believers. But first, I want to just uh, clean up a couple of things from uh, uh, the first uh, about, about, about resolving conflict. Romans chapter 12, verse 18. I want to go back to that again because I thought I left a few things unmentioned. I just want to mention Romans chapter 12, verse 18 says, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Uh, and I, I just think this is so important because, you know, God's desire for us is peace. Jesus died uh, promising us clearly that we can have peace. And I think nothing will undermine our peace more than unresolved conflict. And uh, uh, so when Paul writes this to the to Romans, it's interesting just breaking down the verse a little bit. Uh, again, if it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. The word uh, for possible is a Greek word, donaton, donaton, I think it's donaton. I don't know if we have any Greek scholars out there. I believe it's donaton. And, it, and donaton expresses the idea of something potentially difficult, but nonetheless doable. So when Paul says, if it is possible, what he is saying is that it's, it may be difficult. It is, it is potentially difficult, but it's nonetheless doable. Then he talks about the Greek words for as much as it depends on you. The Greek word for as much as it depends on you expresses, expresses placing the responsibility of maintaining peace and keeping a good attitude on us toward the other person we find to be offensive. And remember who Paul was writing this to, the first century Roman believers. These were people who weren't just having stressful relationships with their mama and their brothers and sisters and co-workers. These were people who were being persecuted, these were people facing tremendous opposition. These were people who were being marginalized. These are people who were going through some real conflict. And this was Paul's counsel to them. So to keep that in perspective, a couple of things I want to mention here. So do it, if it is possible, as far as to be with you, be at peace with all men. What it does not mean, it does not mean agreeing with a person. It does not mean condoning what a person does. It does not mean you discard your, or compromise your beliefs. Doesn't mean any of that, but it does mean, it simply means you, you, you choose not to enter the fray. You choose not to enter the fray. You choose to not attend every argument that you're invited to. Somebody say amen on that. You refuse to attend every argument you're invited to, and that sometimes you simply agree to disagree. And you ask God to give you the strength and ability to truly love that person. You know, the scripture tells us that peace is not always possible, but we should always actively pursue it because it is more rewarding to resolve a conflict than to dissolve a relationship. Let me say that again. It is more rewarding to resolve a conflict than to dissolve a relationship. And when it comes to this issue, one last piece I want to talk about, and that is the issue, of, issue in the area of fear because one of the reasons why we, we have problems navigating through conflict is because fear is a reality. Uh, there's a fear of being rejected. There's a fear of being misunderstood. There's a fear of making ourselves vulnerable. There's a fear of being judged. Fear makes us distant, defensive, and demanding. Folks, I don't know if you know this, but biblically there's only one antidote for fear. There's only one antidote for fear. Do you know what that is? One antidote for fear. I heard that's the love. Scripture says, 2 Timothy verses 1 to 7, 7, 7 says, and this has really helped me in my, in my walk with the Lord. It says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. 1 John 4, 18 says, 1 John 4, 18 says, there is no fear in love. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear because, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. The biblical antidote for fear is love. So when we are going through those difficult conflicts with people, we shouldn't pray for more courage. We should pray for a deeper level of love for the person. 
We need to pray for a supernatural, Jesus-fed, Holy Spirit-driven love that we aren't able to, I'm telling you, I don't know about you, maybe you can. I cannot bolster that up in my own abilities. I need to ask the Lord and the Holy Spirit to give me a deeper love and pray for a supernatural love for that person I'm in conflict with. Lastly, uh, peace does not come through winning arguments, but through changing hearts. <laughs> I have never had any, I'm 65 years old. I know you find that hard to believe. Uh, <laughs> I'm 65 years old. I've never had anybody ever tell me, Tom, thank you so much for arguing with me, arguing with me and straight, setting me straight. <laughs> never happened. I've had, had them say, Tom, thanks for being an example. I've, had, I've, I've heard that. But I've never heard this, 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 I've never heard anybody say, thank you for straightening me out. See, Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26 says, a new heart also I will give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart of your flesh, and I will give you a heart, a flesh. See, true change happens only at the level of a person's heart and spirit. True change only happens at the, at the person's heart and spirit. You've heard me say this before, your prayers for people will be more powerful and effective than your words to people. Your prayers for people will be more powerful and effective than your words to people. And also, lastly, always use the magic question. You guys know what the magic question is. I think I've used it a few times. The magic question, if you're in conflict with someone and you need to address it, the magic question, may I have permission to speak into your life? May I have permission? to speak into your life. I've used that dozens of times. I've never had anyone ever say to me, no. And if they did, what I would say, I prefer to have your permission, but I gotta tell you anyway. <laughs> Amen. Moving on. So this week, I wanna talk about, uh, talk about something to really a grasp and grab a hold of for 2024. 2024, there's a big event coming up. Anybody know what that is? I see my wife does because we, 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 uh, anybody know what's coming up in 2024? Seriously? Yeah, yeah, that's, thank you, Brian. We've got an election coming up in 2024. And um, I, I, I am really concerned about our country. You know, I'm going to make some comments. I, I would never dishonor a pastor's pulpit by talking about political persuasions that I have or political things that I think. But pastorally, it, it would be malpractice not to address certain issues, right? I love what Victor Hugo said. So I'm not going to stump for a candidate. You'll never know who I voted for. You'll never know. You'll never know. And if you think you know, you're probably wrong. <laughs> uh, relax. So re relax, relax. I'm not going to stump for a candidate. Uh, I'm not going to tell you how to vote. But we ought to be concerned about our country. Victor Hugo said something that I think is so pertinent for today. You can resist an invading army, but you cannot resist an invasion of ideas. Woo. You can resist an invading army, but you cannot resist an invasion of ideas. See, ideas are the seeds of, of ideology. Ideas are the seeds of ideology. Ideas create ideologies which eventually create accepted beliefs. And I want to say on point because, folks, right now, we got some crazy ideas out there. Without a, without a, I say this all, without a shot being fired, with nothing getting blown up, with no event happening, we got some crazy ideas out there. 1 Corinthians 1, 4, 2, and to kind of set up what I want to talk about, I want to talk about one of my favorite issues to kind of set this up, and that is um, stewardship. So 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, Verse 2 says, moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. Moreover, it is, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. 1 Corinthians 4.2. Not successful, not wealthy, not even impactful. It is required that stewards be found faithful. I have found that there are five things we steward in life. There are five things that we steward in life. Amen? First thing, what color are you guys like? Light green? Easy, easy crowd. 
<laughs> First thing is time. Time. Can't see it, huh? We don't own anything. God owns simply stewards of what he has laid our hands to. First thing we steward is time. Time is our most precious resource. Time. Time is our most precious asset because it's irreplaceable. I can't take two hours today and bank it for tomorrow. Time is our most precious commodity. Psalms chapter 90, verse 12 says, So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Number two. Second thing we steward in life is our talent. This is why I want to just kind of not pick on, but just want to note Ashley and just a tremendous job she did this morning in just sharing her gift with us. Because talent is something that we have to steward. See, talent is God's gift to us. How we use that talent is our gift back to God. Amen. Talent is our most personal commodity or our most personal resource. See, Ashley could get up and sing this morning. We all felt blessed. Trust me, if I got up and sang this morning, we feel a lot of things. One of them would not be blessed. <laughs> Might be comedic. <laughs> but blessing would not be where we would land. James chapter 1, verse 17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Again, understand you have a talent. You have a talent. You have a talent. You have a talent. And your talent is God's gift to you. Your stewardship of that talent is your, your stewardship and your growth, by the way. Your growth of that talent is God's, is your gift back to God. 2 Timothy verse 1, 6 to 7 says, Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift or fan into flame of God, the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given, again, God has not given a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Second thing we, we steward is talent. The third thing we, 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 we steward is treasure. And uh, I, don't know, I, I don't know if we have any English teachers out there, but I did double check with my wife that that's how you spell treasure. Did I get it right? Uh, yes. <laughs> Praise God. Actually, I'll get a smiley. I'll get a smiley face later on. Um, treasure. Treasure is our most practical resource. Uh, Matthew chapter nine. Matthew chapter six, nineteen twenty one says, "Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven." Lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And this is the one thing we talk about in the church the most, is that is, 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 the, is the stewardship issue when it comes to treasure. So I'll spend the least amount of my time on that. But I will say this. Young people, how many of you have some young people here? Let me tell you something. I'm going to give you the, I want to give you the benefit of my 40 years of common sense. <laughs> because the first 25 eh, didn't have so much. Uh, money does two things for you. That's it. That's all money does for you. Money allows you to have options. It allows you to go to Ruth Chris instead of McDonald's. It allows you to go on a vacation instead of a staycation. That's what money, it gives you options. The second thing money allows you to do is to bless others. That's it. Money can't buy happiness. Money can't buy significance. Money surely can't buy peace. But money, but, but treasure is the third thing that we steward. The fourth thing that we steward is information. Information. Information is the fourth thing that we steward. In information, now, so uh, treasure is our most practical resource. Information should be our most protected resource. Time is our most precious. Talent is our most personal. Treasure is our most practical. And it should be, and information should be our most protected. Jesus said something very interesting in John, in, in, in John chapter 16, verse 12, Gospel of John, 
16, 12. Jesus said, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Jesus said, I have many things I'd like to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Jesus was stewarding information. In other words, what Jesus was saying, there are some things I'd like to tell you, but you can't handle it right now. Information is something we need to steward well. Because let me make this plain, there are some things we need to keep to ourselves. There are some things that people need to know on a need-to-know basis only. Who has ever gotten into trouble by saying the wrong thing at the wrong time? Come on, somebody. Right? Everybody's hand goes up. Information. We have, it. we have to learn to steward information. There is a word for people who can't steward information. You know what that is? A gossip. Information is something that we steward. Quick aside, one of the reasons why we, we're, having, we're having issues, and listen, hear my heart on this, my heart. We're having issues in our school, we're having issues in the educational system by trying to give five-year-olds, seven-year-olds, 10-year-olds information they're just not ready for. We have chaos in our schools because we're sharing things with 10-year-olds that they are not emotionally, mentally, or spiritually ready to handle. For that matter, most 25-year-olds 25 25 aren't able to spiritually, mentally, or emotionally handle it. We, and we've all been there. We've all gotten in trouble for saying the wrong thing at the, at the wrong time. I've seen more relational damage caused by this by, than by all the other things that we do put together. There's one more, by the way. And I said that great philosopher, theologian, Jack Nicholson, <laughs> said, you can't handle the truth. Information is the fourth thing. I wish I had more time to get into that. Uh, Listen, I, I, let me just share this. You've heard me say this before, but advi advice is rarely taken. Unsolicited advice is never taken. If you look at the life of Jesus, what Jesus' life tells you that everybody deserves a response. Everybody deserves a response, but not everybody deserves an explanation. Stewarding information. There are many interactions that Jesus had with people. He did not tell them what he could have told them. Stewarded, he stewarded information. Good news travels fast. Bad news travels at the speed of light. <laughs> I wish I had more time to talk about that. Number five, and this is where we want to land. This is what we want to talk about today. The fifth thing that we steward in life is influence. 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 The fifth thing that we steward in life. See, normally the influence conversation revolves around who we can have influence over. Now, as believers... We are called to be salt and light. We, sh we are called to have influence. And we should seek to influence the world around us. We should, we should seek to bring the light of Jesus into our workplace. We should seek to bring the life, light of Jesus into our homes. We should se seek to bring the life of Jesus into everything that, we, everything that we are connected to. However, to me, the big issue today, again, what do we have coming up in 2024? The biggest issue we have today is who we allow to influence us. It is impossible to live a right life and have wrong influences. Influence is our most powerful resource. I'll say it again. Influence is our most powerful resource. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 30, 33 says, Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33 says, Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Bad company is not just the people you hang out with. It's the entertainment you expose yourself to. It's the podcast you listen to. It's the fruitless arguments you don't walk away from. Perhaps the most important decision you will ever make in life is who you will let influence you. Your parents may determine your history, but your influence and your mentors will determine your destiny. I'll say that one more time. Your parents may determine your history, but your influences and your mentors will determine your destiny. Influence is our most powerful community, commodity. And it's the most powerful thing that we saw. But however, here's a problem. Here's a challenge in the 21st century, particularly in the church. This is a problem. There is no shortage of influencers. I have a gold star panel. I have two gold stars. I, I may have mentioned this to you before. I have two gold star panels. One is a panel of women. 
because as you know, I do a lot of ministering at men's events and, and men's conferences. So I always want to get a woman's take on things because, you know, sometimes you need to, because women, you, you, you all just talk different. So talk different, you, you view things differently, you got common sense, you actually, actually, you'll actually think before you talk. So I got a gold star panel with that, I always bounce things off. And then I also got a gold panel of millennials and Gen Xers to bounce things off. And one of my gold star millennial, millennial members said something to me that made me stop in my tracks. My daughter said this. She said, Dad, the biggest difference between your generation and my generation is we have more voices. And I thought about what Solomon said. Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. Well, the fact is, there's always been voices. That's nothing new. But what's different now is the amount of voices that exist. So the question is, how do we filter through this? See, social media has been, as I said, Social media has, has made a cottage industry of influence and influencers. The influence of marketing industry is a 16.4 billion with a B. $16.4 billion industry and growing steadily. And here's a couple of influence stewardship principles. When you don't intentionally, when you don't intentionally seek influencers, you unintentionally get influenced. And it's usually from voices that don't serve you well. When you don't intentionally seek influencers, you unintentionally get influenced. And it's usually from voices that don't serve you well. Manage your media because everyone has an agenda. Ooh. Manage your media because everybody has an agenda. And for most of them, you're not at the top of their, you're not at the top of their list of concerns. Again, we have an election coming up in 2024. <laughs> When it comes to stewarding influence in our life, everybody wants to sit at our table. There are a lot of voices that are competing for our influence trying to influence. There are cultural voices, there are academic voices, there are entertainment voices, there are political voices. I believe the most powerful voice of all these voices is political voices. And understand what politics has devolved into. I believe that there are four great religions in the world. Now, four great religions, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, and politics. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to spend just a few minutes on this, and now I'm going to get off and, and get into our, our topic at hand in, in regards to influence. Because what we want to go, what we want to do into twenty, what we want to do going into twenty twenty four, we want to be sure that we are vetting our voices. We want to be sure that we are vetting our voices, that we are aware of who we are allowing to speak into our lives. Get into that in a second. Few things. So God created. Spent a few things on this on politics. You know, it's not a message on politics, but in my humble opinion, it's the greatest influence in our life. God created government. God created government, but people created politics. Politics is the art and science of using, abusing, and staying in power. In America, people get elected primarily to get reelected. Amen. <laughs> politics is person. Politics is purposed by people for personal power, perks, and position for the benefits of a few. Politics is purposed by people for personal power, perks, and position for the benefits of a few. In my humble opinion, it is, again, the greatest influence in our world today. Government is purposed by God to bring service, sacrifice, and structure for the benefit of all. Can I get an amen on that? So, I do believe this, the better you know God's voice, the easier it is for you to spot bad influences. Here's what I know, in this church, I know this in this church, you get the word of God. Amen. That I know for a fact. You get the unadulterated, unapologized, straightforward, straight up word of God. Unfortunately, that's just one day a week. <laughs> you got to live from Monday to Saturday. You have got to take control of the voices that speak into your life from 2024. See, 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit. Do not believe every, do not believe every spirit. Don't believe every cultural spirit. Don't believe every political spirit. 
don't believe every educational spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Listen. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. So every other voice at least is up to question. I'm not saying every other voice needs to be dis dismissed, but it's at least up to question. So this begs the question, who's influencing you? This morning, I want to look at the title of this morning's message is Communication Matters, Vetting Your Voices. Vetting. Vetting is the act or process of appraising or checking a person or thing for suitability, accuracy, or validity. Vetting is the act or process of appraising or checking a person or thing for suitability, accuracy, or validity. And this morning, what I do is I want to look at a biblical case study on voices. That I think we can extract some principles from this 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 uh, uh, this situ this situation out, out of the Old Testament. I think we can grab some principle from principles out of this narrative that can help us learn how to better vet our voices. Amen. Okay, so we're going to go to Second Chronicles chapter ten. Second Chronicles chapter ten. Vetting your voices. The most important thing you need to do in 2024 is you need to vet your voices. You need to, you need to take control, or you need, to, you, you, you need to allow God to give you guidance in who you allow to speak into your life. We've got to stop this. We just can't be passive anymore. We just can't be passive, because there's a lot of voices out there that don't serve us well. Okay, 2 Chronicles chapter 10. And Rehoboam went to Shechem, 2 Chronicles chapter 10, verse 1. And Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had gone to Shechem to make him king. So it happened when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, heard it. He was in Egypt where he had fled from the presence of King Solomon. The Jeroboam returned from Egypt. It's important that I stop here and give a little backstory as to what's going on here. Solomon the king is now dead. Rehoboam, Solomon's only recognized son, now, Solomon was a busy man. He probably had more than one son. I mean, he had like 300 wives and 700 girlfriends, and it's just, he's just it's nuts, <laughs> basically. <coughs> but Rehoboam was Solomon's only recognized son, and therefore was looking to ascend to the throne at this time. And at this time, the kingdom was starting to fracture into two sections. The, north, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. That's all you need to know for the purposes of, of our conversation today. Rehoboam, Solomon's son, so Rehoboam, Solomon's son, were fairly well established in one part of this fractured part of the country, but wasn't as established in the other part of the fractured country. Verse 3. You with me so far? Good. Okay. Verse 3. Then they sent for him and called him, and Jeroboam, Jeroboam, by the way, was a recognized leader in the other section. Then they sent for him and called him, and Jeroboam and all Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam, saying, Your father made our yoke heavy, now therefore lighten the burdensome service of your father and his heavy yoke which he put on us, and we will serve you. So understand, Solomon was a great king. Solomon got a lot of stuff done. Great building projects, great projects, great things. He got, but he got all the things done on the backs of the people. This is before you had real machinery to build things. So all the things that Solomon accomplished was accomplished on the backs of the people. And the people were tired. They were shot, exhausted. So as Rehoboam is ascending to the throne, they come to Rehoboam saying, your father made our yoke heavy. Now therefore lighten the burdensome service of your father and his heavy yoke which he put on us, and we will serve you. Verse 5 says, so he said to them, come back to me after three days, and the people departed. By the way, the people came to Solomon. The, be, the people came to Solomon. The best way to answer a question, this is an aside, the best way to answer a question is always with a question. The free. Any dads in here? Dads, raise your hand. Any dads? Your kids come to you with a question. Dad, I learned this a long time ago. They come to me with any question when they were growing up. My answer was always the same. Any idea what it was? No, no, no not, not that bad. <laughs> it was, what did your mother say? Oh. 
you're welcome. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, kids can be a little devious. Bless their little hearts. <laughs> anyway, uh, your father made our yoke heavy. Now, therefore, lighten the burden some service of your father and his heavy yoke which he put on us. We will serve you. So he said to them, come back to me after three days. And the people departed. Then, verse 6, then King Rehoboam consulted the elders who stood before his father Solomon while he lived, saying, how do you advise me? How do you advise me? Somebody say me. me. How do you advise me? Say me. me. It's important. How do you advise me to answer these people? So, so Rehoboam goes to the elders who served with Solomon to find out their advice on the best way for him to answer this question. How do you advise me to answer these people? And they spoke to him saying, if you are kind to these people and please them and speak good words to them, they will be your servants forever. But he rejected the, rejected, somebody say rejected. rejected. He rejected the advice which the elders had given him and consulted the young men who he had grown up with. Let me tell you something. Don't ever go to someone less qualified for a second opinion. (laughs) So he went to the elders who served with Solomon, his father. Then he went to his boys to ask him what they thought he should do. Right? Verse 7. But he rejected the advice which the elders had given him and consulted the young men who he had grown up with. Again, if you're going to get a second opinion, please don't go to someone less qualified. And by the way, Rehoboam is like most people. Most people don't come to you with a question to get an answer. Again, this will bless you. Most people don't come, to, don't come to you to get an answer. They just come to say, I talk to you. They just come to say, I check the box. We don't come to get an answer. They're just saying, I check the box. I tried that. I talked to him. Verse 9, verse 8, but he rejected the advice with the elders had given him and consulted the young men who were grown up with him, who stood before him. In verse 9 says, and he said to them, what advice do you give? How should we? Somebody say we. It's interesting, when he talked to the elders, he said, how do you advise me? When he talked to his boys, he said, how should we answer them? Interesting. What advice do you give? How should we? Answer this people and have spoken to me, saying, Lighten the yoke which your father put on us. Then the young men who had grown up with him spoke to him, saying, Thus you shall speak to the people who have spoken to you, saying, Your father made your our yoke heavy, but, it, but you make it lighter on us. Thus you shall say to them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's waist. And now, whereas my father put a heavy yoke on you, I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips. I will chastise you with scourges. In other words, you think you had a bad under my dad? You ain't seen nothing. I'm about to double down on this stuff. Verse 12 says, So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam on the third day as the king directed, saying, Come back to me the third day. Then the king answered them roughly, and here's the first, here's the first punchline. Then the king answered them roughly. Here's the first punchline. King Rehoboam rejected the advice of the elders, and he spoke to them according to the advice of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, and I will add to it. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scourges. So the king did not listen to the people, for the turn of events was from God, that the Lord might fulfill his word, which he had spoken to the hand of Ahijah, Shilonite, to Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Now when all Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, now when all Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, the people answered saying, what share have we in David? We have no inheritance in this son of Jesse. Every man to your own tent, O Israel. Now see to your own house, O David. So Israel departed to their tents, but Rehoboam reigned over the children of Israel who dwelt in the cities of Judah. Before I said that the two, the two sections of the kingdom was beginning to fracture, after Rehoboam's response, it was completely fractured. Forever fractured. Verse 18, that's where we close. Then King Rehoboam sent Hadaram, who was in charge of revenue, but the children of Israel stoned him with stones and he died. Therefore, King Rehoboam mounted his chariot in haste to flee to Jerusalem. So Rehoboam's now got to, he's now got to take it on the lamb. He's now got to run away because the people are so upset with him. Matter of fact, the people are so upset that they killed one of his emissaries. And here's the second punchline. 
So Israel has been a rebellion against the house of David to this day. Because of Rehoboam's action, the kingdom was completely fractured. I hope that, I will hope that we enter 2024 with a ter- determination and decision of who speaks into our life. Rehoboam had two people, or had two sets of people speak into his life. One of the costliest mistakes you can make is listening to the wrong voices. It is impossible to live a right life listening to the wrong voices. And I just want to take five things. I'll be brief. There are five things I think we can learn from this example of Rehoboam that we can apply to our lives as far as how we can discern what I call a pertinent voice from a relevant voice. A pertinent voice from a relevant voice. See, pertinent means having a clear and decisive relevance to the matter of hand. See, not all relevant voices are pertinent, but all pertinent voices are relevant. <laughs> not all relevant voices are pertinent. So all, not all relevant voices are decisive and relevant to the matter at hand, but all pertinent voices are relevant. How to qualify or how to vet a voice. The scripture we read this morning, is a, is, I think, is a case study on the power of influence and the power of the voices we allow to speak into our lives in recognizing good voices from pertinent voices. So, number one, I just want to go down. I'm going to skip through some things. As we look at this this group, the, the pertinent voices were the elders. The relevant voices were the young men. He chose to listen to the young men instead of the elders. The first thing a pertinent voice does is it inspires and positively grows your influence. A pertinent voice inspires and positively grows your influence. See, pertinent voices don't look to enlarge you, they look to enlarge your influence. See, the other set of counselors were focused purely on him. and how. So the young men, they were focused more on Rehoboam and Rehoboam's ability to exercise his greatest power to exercise greater power. Relevant voices, will always speak to our, relevant voices will always speak to our ego, but pertinent voices will always speak to our best interests. Relevant voices will speak to our ego, but pertinent voices will speak to our best interests. See, pertinent voices partners and harmonizes and resonates with the voice of God in your life. Pertinent voices do not drown out the voice of God in your life. They not only speak to you, but they speak to where God is calling you. And they also realize that God is more interested in building your character than building your platform. Pertinent voices realize that God is more interested in building your character than building your platform. See, the young men were more concerned about about Rehoboam's power and by inference, their own power. The elders were more concerned about the people and by inference, compassion for the people. One of the differences. Pertinent voices want to inspire your influence. The other thing is this, is that pertinent voices, when you ask for their loyalty, write this down. This is good. What they, I don't know what they charge you to come in this morning. Whatever they charge you to come in, this is right here, was worth it. Whatever, whatever they charge to come in this morning. <laughs> here's, what, here's what pertinent voices do. When you ask for their loyalty, they give you their integrity. And when you ask for their integrity, they give you their loyalty. Pertinent voices, when you ask for their loyalty, they give you their integrity. And you ask for their integrity, they give you their loyalty. Number one, pertinent voices inspire your influence. Grow your influence. Positively grow your influence. And also positively grows it to the benefit of all those around you. When I was raised in my family, the voices that spoke to me were not voices that would cause fractures between me and my wife. Because they realized that was the most important thing at that time was for me to be a father. And a... Listen, I've said this before. Pastor at my church, did some different things, held, held different positions. Bottom line is, if something happened to me, they can find, in two seconds, they can find 500 guys who, do what could, who could do what I did there. But there's only one person that could be Lori's husband, and only one person could be Rainer Phil's and Steph's dad. That simple. Inspire your influence. Number two, listen. Pertinent voices listen. They listen to you to earn the right to speak into your life. They listen to you to earn the right to speak into your life. Pertinent voices listen more than they speak. 
Relevant voices speak more than they listen. They believe in the scripture we talked about last year, last week, James 1.19. They understand the law of proportionality. James 1.19 says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Pertinent voices listen. Because they understand a pertinent voice asks questions because they know the right questions asked is a problem half solved. Pertinent voices, a vetted voice, realize that the right questions asked is a problem half solved. Number three, pertinent voices understand and know the word of God. They can provide a biblical context for everything they say. This is what I love about this church and your pastor. He will provide a biblical context for everything that he says. A pertinent voice will always lead with a biblical perspective, which is what concerns me so much about this issue of influence in our culture, is that so often we're being influenced by people who do not bring a biblical perspective to the, to the dance. That's a must for us. Do they have, a, pertinent voices have an expectation of your success. They're invested in you and committed to your growth. They have an expectation of your success because they are personally invested in you. Pertinent voices don't judge you based on how you compare to others. Ooh, this is good. Pertinent voices don't judge you based on how you compare to others. They judge you based on how you compare to your potential. They know that quick success will build your ego, but slow success will build your character. Listen, please hear me. Listen, please hear me. Honestly. Most of, the relevant, most of the relevant voices we hear today are basically a marketing company trying to sell us on something. It might be a product. It might be a construct. It might be a value. It might be a worldview. But most voices that are out there in our culture today, they're trying to sell us something. We need to understand that. Pertinent voices want you to make sure, ooh, pertinent voices, I'm really emptying the trunk. I'm emptying, I'm emptying the, the back, the, the, the trunk today. <laughs> Something else I've noticed. Pertinent voices want you to make up your own mind so you get all the credit. But they're there to support you when things go wrong to help you carry some of the burden. I'm going to say that again real slow. Pertinent voices want you to make up your own mind so you get all the credit. But they're there to support you when things go wrong to help carry some of the burden. I'll tell you something I've learned. Sometimes relevant voices want you to take their advice so that they can take the credit but disappear when things go wrong. That's a good place to say amen right there. See, the old men were concerned about Rehoboam's assignment and its success. The young men were more concerned about Rehoboam's power and position, and by inference, again, their own success. Number four, as I said, they have an expectation of your, sex, of your success. Next, they need to know your history. And I guess I two things, two more things I want to share here. Yeah, two more things I want to share. They need, to, they need your history. See, a pertinent voice knows your history. See, relevant voices are restricted to knowledge. Pertinent voices has knowledge, but also recognizes your history. The old men knew the history. The old men knew the history. They knew what the people dealt with. They knew how much hi, they, they knew how much the people uh, they, they knew how much the people had suffered and how much the people got accomplished. The young men had no clue. They were clueless to the history. Pertinent voices know your history. And part of knowing your history is knowing your blind spots. Pertinent voices, they know your blind spots and love you enough to make you aware of them. <laughs> Last thing is this. Content and clarity. Their content is greater than their volume. Clarity is the first goal of communication. It's been said, I don't want to take a bullet for this, <laughs> but it's been said that educators take the simple and make it complicated. Communicators take the complicated and make it simple. Pertinent voices are clear, enriching content. Their volume is lower than their content. It seems like some people believe the more they, the louder they say something, some people believe, some people believe they have to say, the, the, the louder they say something, the truer it is. <laughs> See, a pertinent voice is more focused on content than on volume. The elders whispered. The young men shouted. Just because you say it louder doesn't make it more true. 
Don't assume Lord, don't assume loud is strong and quiet is weak because you will be surprised. One last thing. I do have one last thing. This is this. Pertinent voices know your story, or they have a story. So the voices that you listen to, the voices I would encourage you to lean into, are voices that have a story. Voices that have a story. Again, remember all the other stuff we talked about, biblical worldview, all that great, but they have a story. A pertinent voice must have the fruit of success and accomplishment. Ultimately, they have a testimony, a story. They have a track record. Don't judge a person based on what they've accomplished. Judge a person based on what they've overcome. I tell you, speaks into my life, is people will overcome something. I talked to my brother Rich last week and just some of the things he's had to overcome and deal with. That speaks to my heart. See, some people were born on, some people hit a triple, some people were born on third base and they think they hit a triple. Don't vet a voice based on what they've done. Vet a voice based on what they have overcome. Has it been any value to you this morning? Yeah. Amen. Amen. So I just want to, clo- I want to close with this. So my wife and I, one of the first positions we had at our, our church is we were the, uh, we, we oversaw our, uh, all ministries. And every time a new member uh, came, uh, joined the church, we would sit down and have an interview with them. And I don't know if you remember this. But even back then, the one thing I would always tell them, who is speaking into your life? I'd always ask him that. And I really believe that that is even more important now than ever because there are so many voices out there. So many voices out there. We need to, we need to steward. We need to steward what, what seeks to influence us. Amen? Amen? So with that, listen, it's been a great three weeks. I hope this has been of some value to you. You, know how, you guys know how I feel about this. I took... I took 45 minutes of your time. You ain't never getting back. (laughs) Thank you for being such kind hosts to us. And Brian, I'll have you uh, close out for us. Thank you so much. And Lori, thank you. Isn't it awesome when um, our pastor decides to take time away and God is still speaking in, in his house? So amen to that. Uh, so uh, as we go into our, our uh, last two songs, our invitation song, uh, Be Unto Your Name. And uh, so um, during this invitation time, once again, this is our time uh, to reflect uh, in our lives and, and also uh, to, uh, to speak um, to, uh, to our Lord and Savior and what he has on his heart for us. And uh, so uh, I welcome you uh, for anybody who would like to come to the altar and uh, uh, pray and kneel before our Lord. Uh, for anybody who uh, would like to, um, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, um, and this for anybody that might be listening online, um, now is the time. And... Uh, you know, we don't know what 2024 has planned for us. Uh, but one thing we do know is Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. And with him, uh, we do have peace. So um, as our, our worship team uh, leads us in the invitation song, um, enjoy this time with our Lord. We'll stand to sing this.
life is all about change. As Pastor Thomas said, one of the four constants of life is change. And speaking of change, we have a very, very fast but important announcement. Worship is only and ever about the one living God that we worship. Amen. And we never want to take anything away from that. While at the same time, I wanted to recognize that there is a change in our worship team coming. So you don't be confused this time next week when you don't see her up here, Natalie Wolf, who has led you in worship all these past years, is stepping down from our team as of next week. There's travel. You've been faithfully commuting to church and rehearsal a good hour each time, right? So it's been, you've been faithfully coming here. You've been driving a long way to yes, get here yes, for eight rehearsals. Years. <laughs> Yeah, so now. amen to that. And so God called her to a church that's closer to her. I think it's like right across the street. Yeah, it's like two minutes away from You can't house. get more convenient than yeah. that. So praise yeah. God, right, to have us move to. <laughs> but um, we've known about this transition for a couple of months. So uh, God is leading us in our new direction. But we will miss you. And thank you for serving so faithfully these eight yeah. years. Yeah. She's also served the children's choir, so we have some, we have uh, people to take over for that, right? Becky, we're gonna, Becky, you and I are gonna lead the kids, so brace yourselves. <laughs> Parents, we're gonna be leading the kids. <laughs> so, um, but you'll be greatly missed by your church family. And this is just one example of how we are constantly changing and growing, which supplies the reassurance when we need it. And our new song, Always, which we started talking about last week contains that one key reminder that our God never changes. He is faithful and consistent in all he does. When he says he will do something, he will do it. We can trust him. There are countless stories in the Bible of him doing just that. And there's something amazing that, that happens, powerful, that comes when we come together to remind ourselves of who it is we worship. We sing it to the Lord, and as we do, we remind ourselves this. And may the truth shared in this new song get into your spirit as we head into 2024. So God bless you. Revelation 1.8 says this. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and was and who is to come, the Almighty.
So uh, next week, um, we will uh, resume our normal uh, services uh, with Sunday School, and uh, we want to welcome Pastor Zach and Becca uh, back next week. And uh, again, thank you, Thomas and, and Lori. Uh, thank you, Praise and Worship Team, and uh, Natalie. Um, we will miss you, but uh, we, wish you, we wish you very well. Um, let's close out in prayer, too, to our Father. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for this wonderful day. We thank you for the message that you delivered. Um, Lord, we pray that uh, we would be reflective upon the influence that you have in our lives. And Lord, you have called us not to just keep that within ourselves, but to share that with the world, the love of Jesus Christ. And may we do that, Father, faithfully and boldly in your name. May you receive all the honor and the glory. We love you. We pray for our sister Natalie as she uh, uh, goes into um, her next uh, church family, Lord, we know that uh, uh, she's been faithful in, in praying to you, and, and we praise you and thank you that you have found a home for her, and may you bless her. We love you, and we look forward to uh, worshiping with you throughout this week and next week as well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.